like to start off with Meredith Schubert. Right there. Good evening. Um, thank you, Elba, for having this event and hosting this event. Each time when I came in, they said, we've seen you before. I think this is my fourth election. <laughs> um, I'm Meredith Schubert. I'm a district court judge here in Lincoln County, which also has the um, district of Cleveland County, or the county of Cleveland County. I've served in this position for 13 years. Um, I've got a copy of um, my card that has a lot of information about my qualifications and my experience. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a native of Lincoln County. I grew up here with my family, my parents, and my grandparents on both sides. So I was very fortunate to live in this community and give to this community for um, the entire time I was growing up. I graduated from Lincoln High School in 1987. Then I attended North Carolina State University and I graduated from there in 1991. After graduating from college, I moved back to Lincoln County and lived here. I worked in Charlotte for three years in communications, which was my major, from college, and I decided to follow, to follow in my father's footsteps and go to law school. So I attended law school and graduated cum laude. I finally got to where I was making really good grades by the time I got to law school. And I came back to Lincolnton and I worked here in downtown Lincolnton for 10 years with my father and his um, partner, Bob Lewis. We had a general law practice I uh, spent most of my time in family law and criminal defense, as well as many other areas of the law. And that really helped me when I became a district court judge in February of 2007. I was appointed to that position initially. It was a new seat, a newly created seat. And um, I've served in that capacity for 13 years. Let me back up a minute. When I was um, a lawyer, I was also um, worked as a contract attorney for the Department of Social Services. And I, for the last five years of my practice, was the guardian ad litem attorney representing children who had been abused and neglected. District court judges have the broadest jurisdiction um, in our judicial system. We hear the most wide variety of cases and we also have the most volume. We hear criminal cases, juvenile cases, civil cases involving uh, family issues as well as contract disputes. Um, as far as criminal law, I've always been I'm very predictable and uh, consistent and I'm tough. We make tough decisions about who to put in jail, who to keep in jail, who to let out of jail and put on probation. And I'm always concerned about the safety of the community and the safety of the citizens when I make those decisions. In civil cases, I deal with family um, issues, custody um, issues between parents and their children. They both love their children, but I've got to decide what the schedule is going to be and in some cases have to restrict people from seeing their children. And then in the juvenile cases, we have both juvenile criminal and then we have the abuse neglect cases, which when children are abused or neglected by their parents, those are very tough decisions. I've heard um, two of the most complex trials in our district in the past two years, uh, one involving the death of a child and uh, another involving severe medical abuse of a child where I've heard from expert witnesses, doctors, specialists, and it takes a lot of, um, it's very beneficial to have a judge who's been on the bench, who's been working in this capacity, who's been making these tough decisions, is familiar with all of these issues, and able to rule on these very complex issues of admissibility of uh, medical evidence, admissibility of evidence in a DWI trial can be very, um, just as, it can be just as complex as a, in a murder trial, the constitutional issues that are involved in that. So I hope I'll have your support. I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for being first. Thank you. <laughs> and I'd like to call up Angela Woods next. My name is Angela Woods. I'm running for a district court seat. That seat is currently being held by the Honorable Larry Wilson, who has decided to retire. Um, I am, I grew up in Kings Mountain. I was born in New Jersey, but I'm a Southerner uh, by rearing, and I've been here for most of my life. Grew up in Kings Mountain, graduated from Kings Mountain High School, went to the College of William and Mary, where I graduated, um, and also I went straight through to law school, where I attended UNC Chapel Hill. Um, with my legal career, it's been very diverse. I started out as an assistant district attorney in Cumberland County, that's Fayetteville, North Carolina, where I represented the state in prosecuting criminals. Mm -hmm. And I also sought to protect the rights of victims. After working in Fayetteville, I came back to Kings Mountain and worked in Charlotte as a juvenile defense attorney for the Children's Law Center. 
I represented juveniles charged with crimes from misdemeanors to first degree murder. Um, so I have a varied background. I am currently the uh, the assessed attorney in Cleveland County, North Carolina, where I handle all child support matters, and I also handle adult guardianship matters, where we seek to protect uh, disabled adults who have been, who may be, or have been neglected or, or abused. And so I have a, a very wide background. Um, Meredith Shufrit described to you what she does, what type of hit background that you need to be a district court judge. I feel most of those slots. Um, I do believe that my experience makes me qualified. I also have integrity, and I believe that justice is achievable when we have people with experience and diverse backgrounds who will sit and hear a case unbiased. Um, it doesn't matter if you're male, female, black, white. You should have a judge that will hear you, listen to the case, and even if you don't agree with that judge, you know that they've heard you. And I have that background to do so. So I ask for your vote. And if you can't vote for me in the primary, see me in the general election. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
I'm running because we need somebody in Raleigh who's working on a resolution for this mess out here on 16 every day. We need somebody fighting for teachers here in Lincoln County so they get the tools that they need to do the job that we hired them to do. I'm running because Lincoln County deserves better. Now I'll make you three simple promises. <coughs> My door will always be open. I don't care what party you're registered with. I don't care what church you go to. You can always come talk to me. I'll talk to anybody. I'm not going to promise I'll always answer my phone. But if I don't, and if you leave a message, I'll call you back. My third promise is every day I'm in Raleigh, I'll be working for Lincoln County, North Carolina. That's a promise you can put in the bank. Thank you very much. Greg McBride, I'd appreciate your vote in November. Thank you. All right. One thing we'll try to do tonight is uh, when anyone is speaking, I want to make sure that we just maintain silence, all right? Uh, it's, it's tough when you're responding to things and distractions are not fair. So just keep that in mind. The people are here to spend time to share their perspective. Let's give them the opportunity with our full respect and quiet for them to be able to answer the questions. Uh, I'll just go through the quick format. We're gonna have opening statements for five minutes per candidate order uh, of the candidates answering each of the questions will rotate. So after we have an individual start a series on one question, the next question, we'll start to the next candidate. We'll just take turns having different individuals start. Uh, topics are gonna range. I'll be reading the questions. There'll be no interaction between or among candidates, audience, or other participants. This is not a debate. Interaction will only be through the moderator. Each candidate will state their opinion and views fully, regardless of any answers from prior candidates for those questions. With that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, start. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to be using my voice because we're limited on mics. Jim Waz. Uh, no question. You just do your five minutes. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is George Pinckney Mall III. I live in the furthest western end of the county you can get to. I can throw a rock into Cleveland, Catawba, and Burke counties. I'm up near the Highway 10 and 18 intersection. I'm a fifth generation Lincoln County native. My family was here when this was Rutherford County. I'm a lifelong Republican, voted every election since I was 18. I went to West Lincoln High School I then went to Lenore Ryan University in Hickory, studied business administration and minored in psychology. After that, I went to Catawba Valley Community College and got two degrees in textile technologies. I have worked with Burke County on the Board of Planning and Zoning and the Board of Adjustment for four years. I've been in Lincoln County for a year and a half now on the Board of Adjustment. I've attended the UNC School of Government and taking a lot of training in quasi-judicial issues and procedure and protocol. <coughs> I run a family business that was started in 1908 by my grandfather in the saddle and harness business. Uh, I seek this position because I feel it's important that everyone contribute something to their county. Both my grandmothers and mother were school teachers. I started getting an education at about five years old. Both my father and both my grandfathers ran stores. My grandfather was a commissioner and a, a magistrate in Lincoln County and the head of the Mason Lodge in Northbrook. Um, I've been, for the last 20 years, I've been in the role of family caregiver and VA caregiver. I'm a federally licensed Veterans Administration fiduciary for 20 years and have received two citations, citations for my service to the VA and my veteran, who is my father. Um, I hope to serve you. I was here two years ago. I did fair in the election. 
Um, I also want to say you will never hear me say anything derogatory or negative about another candidate. I believe you do this out of honor and respect for everybody in the county. And I was raised to be a Southern gentleman. You treat everybody with respect. You shake hands, you open doors. I will be available to anyone in the county. I think I bring something to the table that's a little bit unique as far as my advocacy for <coughs> seniors and veterans and children in this county. My experience over the past 20 years have shown me that a lot of our seniors, our elders in our community, slip through the cracks, and a lot of our veterans slip through the cracks. And it's not for lack of services, because Lincoln County has good services. We have a great VA representative, Alex Patton. We have great county administration. I'm proud to be here with everybody at this table, our two incumbent commissioners, I have a great deal of respect for, and I think we can vote for three commissioners. I can tell you who's going to get my votes. It's these first two seats. Um, I will be here. I will serve honorably, honestly. I've ran the cheapest campaign, I think, in the history of Lincoln County twice now. I've spent less than $400 in both elections. I have turned down campaign contributions because I do not feel a politician should be bought and sold. You can't say, okay, give me $100 for my campaign and I'll look out for your interest. If I'm elected, I'm going to look out for everybody's interest from Indian Creek to the Catawba River. I know there's a lot of issues on planning and zoning and development in eastern Lincoln County, and I guess I'll have an opportunity to represent that at a later point. But I, I appreciate your vote. I may be last on the ballot, but I hope I'm first in your hearts when it's election time. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, the advantage I have over everybody else up here is uh, I've got control of the editing, so my error will disappear. Um, next up, I'd like to give the mic to Carol Mitchell. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, George. Let me uh, go ahead and say a word or two about myself. Almost everybody in here, not everybody, but a lot of you know me, you see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. But thank you, Albert, and thank all the ones that's uh, put on effort to put this on. A lot of times you don't get to see put a name with a face. So you see names on ballot, but you don't know who that is. And this gives an opportunity to put a, a, a face with a name or a name with a face. Let me say this. I've served on the Lincoln County Board of Commissioners uh, several years. Well, I've been fortunate enough through the years. I've served with Mark Oak. I've <coughs> served with Nathan Collin. I've served with uh, Bud Sassina, Milton Sigmund, Rich Permanent. Tom Anderson, Bill Bean, and I made a list here. I may have forgot somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I get everybody? I think I did. And I was happy to be all here, but I'm talking about the ones with, that's here within the crowd tonight. <coughs> and uh, once you become a commissioner, and I think a lot of the commissioners that's uh, come on the first two years understand that there's a lot of things that you think you can do. I thought the same thing first year I went on. But let me assure you, there will be a lot of things that comes forth that you think you can do that you can't do. A lot of cases in our hands are tied. We can't do anything. We just can't do it. But uh, everybody, and the citizens and the voters think you can. But we do not have that obligation. We do not have no magic wand. And we do not have no crystal ball that we can look into and make decisions that I would like to make that all these others that's been on board of the district would have liked to have made. We don't have that opportunity. <laughs> Keeping tax rates low uh, for the 12 surrounding counties. Lincoln County is number four and the lowest in the tax rate. 12 counties, surrounding counties, Lincoln County is fourth lowest. So with the board that's been here before, the one that sits here, we've strived to keep the tax rate low. Evaluations has went up. 
Just look how much more you worked than you worked 10 years ago. So, but we have strived and we've done the very best. What has been on the board the past has done that. To make sure that uh, we kept tax rates low, funding the school system, number one priority, we've got to educate the kids. Law enforcement, we've got to do the very best we can to make sure that the citizens in Lincoln County is protected. And we have, I think, one of the lowest crime rates probably in any area. But we have funded the Sheriff Department. We have funded those people to make sure that they have the best equipment, the best opportunity to do whatever it takes to eliminate criminals in Lincoln County. And I think you'll see that on the statistics. Economic development, we need to continue to fund economic development, keep industry in here so we can help keep the tax rate low, so that we can uh, take the burden off the homeowners, landowners, and get as much industry in here to create jobs for people to help keep that tax rate low. We need less regulations. I don't need more regulations. I've got enough federal to the state uh, regulations. I don't need more regulations. <clears throat> the less regulations we have, I feel like they're off the guard. We uh, sometimes we have to make tough decisions as a county committee. You don't like it, you don't make a tough decision. But we have to do it. You don't like it, citizens don't like it. But I can assure you, <coughs> all since I've been on the board, and the commissioner that has left the board, understand you have tough decisions you have to make. I can make those tough decisions. You may not like it, but I can make it. And we're not going to sue everybody. We're not going to. You're not going to like it, but we, we have to make them, we have to do it. Again, I'll say that our hands are tight. Let's, let's, I'll go ahead and get me a little thing. I know you can be questions about this. We don't tell DOT what to do. We can make suggestions and we can talk to them at the end of it. End of the day, DOT does not fulfill your dreams that you wish, that I wish, and all the citizens wish. Could happen. It's a move, they're always a moving target, and uh, it's always a challenge to deal with DOT. So I see my time's up. Appreciate y'all being here and continue on. Thank you. Anita? Hello, I'm Anita McCall. I am a current CD commissioner, been on for four years. Um, I'm originally from Stanley and moved to Lincoln County 25 years ago, I guess. Um, my background is in engineering. I did uh, drawings for mechanical, electrical, huge walk-in control panels where you bust down three phase to run production facilities. And then the last seven years I did uh, civil geological drawings. And so my background is engineering as well as project management. Um, I also have done a tremendous amount of volunteer work in the community. My father um, was in World War II. I was the last of four children. So I realized, I, I, I think I was just kind of sort of forgotten. They maybe didn't mean to have me. I don't know. I don't know. But my sister is 70 years old, and I'm 53, and there was two boys between us. But um, my daddy raised us all that we're supposed to be community involved. And so he would ask us at the table, what are you working on now for the community? And if you said, well, I just finished doing so da 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 da, he'd say, oh, that's not what I asked you. I said, what are you doing now? And so you learned you better be working on something right now. And so, of course, we were very involved in the church and um, tried to keep something going always there, but also somewhere else so that you could make a difference. And so um, as I was in engineering, you know, you work 40, 50 hours a week. And I worked all over Charlotte, had the opportunity to work for many different companies, including having my own business. Um, got to travel, worked in Germany, worked in Denver, Colorado. Got to do some cool stuff, wrote software to interface with AutoCAD to extract build materials. Woohoo! Now, 
guess what? I say I don't even know what I, none of that stuff, I forgot it all. All I want to do now is serve the public. It's a whole different phase in life for me. My daughter's grown up, she's 31 years old, and I have two grandchildren. When I ran in 2016, the only thing that I promised was that I wouldn't make, well, I ran in 2015 for the election in 2016. I promised that I would make county commission my full-time job, and I have fulfilled that. It absolutely is a full-time job if you do it right. Um, there's a whole lot of meetings that you go to constantly. Um, I've been fortunate enough to go to Raleigh and, and cast our votes in Raleigh for this board when they uh, asked me to do that. We, we vote on who should go, and they've asked me to go. Uh, I've also been to D.C. and voted for us there, which I was honored to be able to do for us. Um, it's not something that we have to do. We've never had people to do those things. But again, it's something that I'm willing to do. Uh, Lincoln County Commissioners, there are five commissioners, okay? Each one of us are at large, so you can live anywhere in the county, all right? There's four gentlemen and myself. It is a tough job. I'm not talking about a little bit. Carol's right. There are two types of cases that we rule on. One's legislative cases, where we get to vote our opinions. The other is quasi-judicial. That's a court case. That means my opinion, or any other commissioner's opinions, does not matter and cannot come into account. Every CUP, conditional use permit, which is the roads, is a quasi-judicial case. That's what he's trying to explain. Now, here's what we've learned how to get around some of that. There's a group called GCLMPO, Gaston Cleveland Lincoln County. We have to compete with them for funding for um, the for the roads. Okay, so if we want money to get something done, we have to compete. So NCDOT is, of course, the ones who holds those meetings. We learned that we had to have the drawings already done, the verbiage already done, and they, they grade all of that. And then they put them all together. I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. My time's up. I'll come out here where everybody can see me. Good evening, I'm Tim Holder. For those who do not know me, I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, thank you, Elba. Thank you, Greg, for all Elba continues to do for the community it has done in the past. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight and speak in front of you. I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I was born and raised in Catawba County, believe it or not. Uh, for those of you who kind of know New Six or Old Sixteen, New Sixteen now, where Christian Tours is, that's where I grew up. My grandparents lived on uh, 150 next to Lebanon. United Methodist Church, if you guys are familiar with that area. Um, let's see. My uh, mom and grandparents, my mom, I've got to give a shout out to. She's in the audience tonight in the back back there. Um, her lifelong Lincoln County residents. My wife and uh, wonderful wife and two kids live in Westport today. Uh, my background, I went to UNC Chapel Hill for college, graduated there, uh, went to work in the utility industry. I spent the last 22 years in the energy slash utility industry specifically focused on uh, economic development and from that is really where I get into what drives my campaign as a whole and what my cornerstone focus is for the campaign. First and foremost is economic development. Um, without economic development we don't have tax base that continues to help offset tax base for our citizens. We've got to continue to fund economic development within the region. That helps us maintain a tax rate at what it is today or even decreases that tax rate. Secondarily to that, uh, infrastructure is an important part for this county. All of us realize the constraints that the water and sewer system has, the constraints that growth has put on our ability to keep up with the needs of that system. 
We've got to focus on that. We've got to put money behind that. We've got to make sure it meets uh, what the growing community needs. And lastly, the focus is on transportation. I'm sure all of you experienced the conundrum after the tanker truck turned over on 16. Uh, deadlock, gridlock for hours upon hours. And while we can't impact DOT as a commission, we can help push those projects forward. We've got a number of projects right now that have already come out of the East Lincoln County Mobility Study, which this board has approved and was a great deal for the county. Now we've got to continue to push that forward. We need a champion within the commission who will take these things and develop a strategic push to promote the growth of this county in the right ways. The problem today is we continue to approve conditional use permits with no conditions associated with them. It doesn't make a lot of sense to have a conditional use permit when you don't put any conditions attached to that permit. You let the, you let the landowner do whatever they want to do. I say all that to say, if you're looking for somebody who sincerely cares about this county and is not in this to be a politician, but here to help what's important to the citizens of Lincoln County, and I encourage you to vote for Tim W. Holder. Visit my website for more information. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Elba. Thank you. Thank you, Elba, for putting this on. And thank you all for coming out tonight instead of watching the, uh, the President's State of the Union message. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we got a lot of talent and a lot of beauty here in uh, Lincoln County. Lincoln County, from the shore, the boating and the fishing, through uh, downtown Lincolnton and out into the rolling hills of West Lincolnton. Up here? That's better. Okay. Uh, West Lincolnton, it's, it's like an extension of the Shenandoah Valley. And the people here, you people here, have a lot of talent. We got a lot of cooks, lawyers, plumbers, the whole bit. People that work in Charlotte and professional careers, we got a lot of talent right here in, in Lincoln County. And we, as the uh, citizens and taxpayers of Lincoln County, deserve a government that spends our money wisely and prudently. Uh, my name is Glenn Fiscus, and I live here in Denver. Uh, my ancestors came over from Germany in uh, 1743. That, that was the year that Thomas Jefferson was born. So uh, there's a lot of history and uh, public service in, the, in my family's DNA. Uh, I've worked in uh, engineering, sales, finance, and chemical, the chemical and power industry. Uh, I've taken 250 megawatt nuclear reactors, critical, I don't know if you all understand it, into a sustained chain reaction. One was on the NS Savannah, the nuclear power merchant ship. Another one was in uh, a critical experiment laboratory. And I've also been in the control room running an automatic turning startup program that synchronized the, just like down at McGuire, it was a nuclear power station. Don uh, McGuire putting it online. The turbine's spinning 3,600 and one half RPM. And you talk about a nervous tension, the adrenaline flows just thinking about it, putting it online. That's a money winning situation for somebody. We don't want to have those running away. Uh, the responsibility of a uh, county commissioner. Uh, needs some experience and judgment and the sensitivity and the sensibility that I think I have as a uh, mature American senior citizen. Uh, some of these guys here are young, I can hold it against you, your immaturity and uh, youthfulness, as Ronald Reagan would say. Uh, whenever you put a turban on line, it's almost as dangerous as making a left turn on St. James or Route 16. We all know how dangerous that is. And we got to select, uh, Mr. McBride brought that question up as, as McCourtney did. 
Uh, the county commissioner, um, the contracts, uh, the county commissioners have to write the specs and review the bids. Uh, the financial, we have a GS system that tells how much each of us pay in taxes, but I think we need a system in the county that shows us where all the money goes, not just a uh, pie chart. We ought to be able to call up and see where every check that's written by the county, where it goes. We need a plan, some plans in the county that aren't just two-year plans. The two-year plan we have now is that you're gonna flush your second floor toilet and it's gonna come out your first floor to moat. And you're gonna turn the water on and all you're gonna get is chlorine. And you're gonna go out to Route 16 and you're gonna spend the rest of your life waiting for the light to change because of all the traffic. One of the, uh, talking about developments, and we've heard, so far, we heard ref referred to about, my hands are tied. And we're gonna hear it from another one of the candidates. I brought my scissors to assure you, my hands are never gonna be tied. The, uh, another question is, do any of you people know uh, Dr. Horton? I see his signs all over. Is he a physician or a, a, a dentist? I, I found out that he was an optometrist. He came to Denver and he saw opportunity and he brought all his friends, Mr. Lenard, Mr. Ryan, and a whole bunch of other develop, developers. And what they've done <laughs> in the last five years is they've raped Denver. They've cut down the trees, <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity and feel free to give me a call. Uh, one, one hint, it's hard for the camera team to follow if you're moving around. My name is Robert Avery and I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm running for county commission, I'm a lifelong member of Lincoln County. I was born here and raised here. But now, the reason I'm running is because of neighborhood safety. Safety is the main thing in neighborhoods right here. The families and citizens need support safety in the neighborhoods. And that's the reason I've been running for it. Because we need to turn neighborhoods back over into the local government and get the same thing. Thank you. My name is Martin Oaks, as I think most of you already know. I was elected county commissioner in December of uh, 2014, and as Carol pointed out, you walk into the office and you think, gee, we can do all these things. And then you find out, well, no, you can't. And then you got to go do some research and find out more things that you can or can't do. The other issue that happens with a new commissioner is you get sworn in and you think your next meeting is in two weeks. Well, wrong. Your next meeting is a budget meeting the following Friday. And you're on the job a week, and you're expected to do a budget. That's a little tough. Uh, when I got elected, three of the county commissioners, that's the majority, told me counties don't do roads. Uh, despite the fact that we did a road in the industrial park off uh, Optimus Club Road at the cost of about $3 million. And two of the commissioners told me don't bother talking to DOT. DOT will do whatever they want. We have no influence. Forget about talking to them. Well, i not not a passive guy, and I decided I wouldn't do that. I tried to find out how to manipulate the system. And one of those ways is that you get developers, you ask the developers, you can't tell the developers to do things. And so as an example, <coughs> You've probably all seen this intersection. You've probably all driven by it. Highway 73 and Ingleside Farm Road. That was done over the past two years. It was finished about a year and a half ago. I'm sorry, last summer. That was paid for entirely by the developer. They went to DOT uh, with our planning department and sat down and said to DOT, 
what do we have to do? And the DOT said, do it this way, and they did. And so that's the kind of thing that can happen. In all of the cases of the large developments that got approved, people say, well, they only did turn lanes. Well, yes and no. Uh, for example, the two developments that are outside of Burt Ridge, yeah, they did their turn lanes, but they kicked in money towards Optimus Club and New 16. Whatever DOT gets around to doing that project, there's $330,000 in the county's bank account waiting to help that project along. If DOT says to us, we don't need that money, that'd be a shock. But if they did, we're allowed to transfer that money to the interchange at uh, Little Egypt, St. James, and Optimus Club, probably turn lanes or something like that. But we get to spend that money. Another development has kicked in money for traffic light at Airlie Parkway and Optimus Club, which will go in once the convenience site goes in immediately across the parkway. And so those are the kinds of things that we get to have happen. The two developments on Business 16 up north, where the turn lanes went in at the same time, unfortunately. One of the developments gave us 18 acres for a school park site. Another development gave us a bunch of land for trails and 18 acres of preserved woodlands to the Catawba uh, Preservation Authority. So those are the kinds of things that can happen. The other thing in development is when I go to the UNC school and talk about what we can do, it turns out that you can do things if you put them in your rule book ahead of time. You can't at the last minute say, oh, I don't like that, we aren't going to approve that. You've got to have a good reason. If you put the good reason in your planning, in your long-range land use plan, or in your UDO, you have a reason to turn down a development. While I was on the board, we got a number of things changed. The development density in East Lincoln was, to quote the zoning administrator, upwards of three units per acre. And I said, what does that mean? Oh, essentially unlimited. Well, I managed to get that changed to two units per acre. And so the developers who come in can't put in quite as many houses. The other thing that happened is we got the specs on traffic congestion reduced so that if you make an intersection, one leg of an intersection, longer than a minute, it goes down a grade by 30 seconds, you can say, you either got to fix that, do whatever it takes to the road to fix it, or we don't have to approve it. That led to the Circle K and the charter school at Club Drive being able to be turned down because of the traffic. And if you get the rules in place ahead of time, then you can make it all I'd like to make one more announcement. Uh, we will be collecting questions, so if you were to, if you had a question that you wanted to post it towards the end of the session, if you put them over here on this table against the far wall, we'll collect them. Okay. All right. I'd like now to go ahead and start with the first question. Okay. First question for the candidates, and we'll be starting with George Mall. Lincoln County real estate taxes, taxes were recently raised approximately 10% on average. Lincoln County reserves are triple the state mandated reserves are growing. Please share your perspective on tax increases and why. I'm not a big fan of taxes. However, our county taxes go to necessary community infrastructure. That money goes to schools, it goes to our emergency and fire department services. It goes to the fire department, the sheriff's department. Those are necessary <coughs> funds in our communities. I'm not opposed to it. I didn't say one word when my tax value on my property went up because I feel I'm getting my money's worth for that, what is it, 5% on 100? Uh, it's worth it. I wouldn't be in favor of raising taxes other than for infrastructure, for community services. Schools, roads, fire departments, rescue squads, a sheriff's department is one of the most important. Um, also, I think one thing 
we can do with some of our tax money is redirect it into the county employee roster for education, being with the Board of Adjustment, with planning and zoning. Uh, I've had the opportunity a number of times to attend University of North Carolina School of Government for quasi-judicial training that handles conditional use permits especially. So we don't need to spend money other than anything but to improve the county. But there again, I'm not one, I'm a conservative. I'm not one to throw money out. We've got a reserve in the bank for the county. I think we need to save it for a rainy day. That's my opinion. Thank you. Same question, and we'll just go down the road. Greg, if you would repeat that question very slowly. Yes. The question is, so here we go. Lincoln County real estate taxes were recently ra raised approximately 10% on average. Real estate taxes were raised? That's the question stated, was yes. The tax rate raised? It was lowered. Tax rate. And yes. you got a reevaluation. The property went up in value, sure. So that's the tax increase because your property went up. We lowered the tax rate. Okay. And then time when reevaluation comes along, your property is more valuable. So therefore, you can pay more tax. We lowered the rate to somewhat offset that. Which is, like I said earlier, the fourth lowest tax rate in 12 counties. Now, another thing. Free, 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 won't, 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 somebody's got to pay it. Now, you want the services, you want all this the county's supposed to provide, we got to find out somewhere to have a pay for it. Come out of your pocket. I have a sheet here which Mr. Fiscus somewhat addressed a while ago. Here it is. You can look at it and see where your money goes. You ain't going to see where the check's written. <laughs> they, they ran out here on the table and wouldn't let me bring them here and let them out. You get all the way out. You can see where your money goes exactly. So therefore, if you want, you're going to have to pay. Now, the state of tax went up. It did call your property coming back. You call that a tax increase? That may be what you call it, but uh, it is what it is. We ordered the tax rate to help offset that. And we got to fund the county to make sure to be the best we can to give the people what they want within a reasonable amount. But we can't do everything on the, we won't do everything. We will do everything everybody wants us to do. You have to take the rate about 80 or 90 cents, won't that? If you get another town, which is not necessary, how much more tax are you going to pay then? You know another 40, 50 cents? They say they say they can do it for a nickel? Ain't no way. Not going to happen. Get the real world. So, I'll continue on. Thank you. What I'd like to do is just work it down the table. I'll do this one question, and then we'll just pass. As Carol said, um, we did a tax re-evaluation. Uh, Lincoln County's tax rate on the 100 was 0. .611. Okay, and that's what it had been. I don't even know how long. Certainly for the four, year, uh, four years that I had been a commissioner. When we did the re-evaluation, of course, our, our valued land, our land went up. And first of all, you need to understand, some counties do a reevaluation every eight years. Lincoln County does it every four years. You want to know how it really might you do it every eight years? Mm -mm. No, we don't do that. Every four years, it gets the reevaluation. We did lower it to 0 .599 to offset that. So, you know, we didn't want it to cause us angst. And we all came to a consensus on that, and we did lower it. Um, just to let you know, Gaston County's tax rate is 0.84 on the hundred, and Cleveland County's is 0.72 on the hundred. And I can assure you that they're not getting any more services. They're certainly not. I'm the only commissioner that lives inside the, the city limits of Lincolnton. 
Therefore, I pay both county and city taxes. I knew that when we bought the house. So I'm not crying the blues, okay? We get additional services because the city provides services. I'm not gonna cry about it. However, I'm not in favor of raising people's taxes, you know, for no additional services, right? So I think we've done the best we can. I hope you agree. Thanks, Anita. Can we repeat the question one more time, Greg, just for me? And yeah, slowly, yeah. please. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So Lincoln County real estate taxes were recently raised approximately 10% on average. Lincoln County Reserve are triple the state mandated reserves in growing. Please share your perspective on tax increases and why. Well, as far as tax increases go, I'm opposed to tax increases. I don't like them, but they're a fact of life. As a property owner, I hope, like many of you, you're glad that your property values are going up versus falling off like they did in 2008. So I can live with that. I think the commission did a good job of lowering the tax rate while those values went up to help us obviously all set. But remember, what drives a lot of this is not necessarily the tax rate or valuation changing. It is the promotion of economic development, new industry and business coming to this community, which provides a tax basis that we as citizens can't make up for. You get a $20 million investment in the, the county like you guys approved last night, I think it was, right? Yeah. Something like that. $27.5 million investment. That's tax basis that us as citizens don't have to deal with. So the, the tax value increase is one thing. I think that the, the, the balance here is how do you take that increase in valuation and use your tax number to keep that as level as you can, if not lower, for the citizens of Lincoln County. So, Glenn. Well, in the immortal words of Lyndon Johnson, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the guy over under the tree. And in the words of the Bible or Shakespeare, the only two things in life that are short are death and taxes. So the only way that we can increase our tax revenue is kind of like, what's the tallest building in Denver right now? Blum has put up a 14-story building down on South, 16 South at Old Plank Road. That's the kind of investment we need, as he referred to, in Denver and Lincoln County that'll keep our taxes individually down low because they'll pay the taxes. And we need more investment like that. The, the, uh, the airport right now is looking for $2 million. They have a, a list of of people that want to put their plane at our little airport, but they can't do it because they have a hole over there and they need $2 million to fill it in so they can put some more hangers over there. That'll bring more revenue into the county that won't cause us to have to pay more taxes. Those are the kind of things that we need to push as commissioners and make sure that that happens. The road situation is, as they have said, the state supposedly has control over that. Well, Jason Sane and Senator Alexander are our representatives in Raleigh, and as you get closer to Raleigh, you notice that the roads get a lot better <laughs> for some reason. They should be out there fighting for our highways and our concrete. That's their job. We ought to be on their back about making sure they do something about it. I'm not for any tax increase. I'll tell you why I'm not for a tax increase. Property valuations have gone up drastically in Lincoln County and will continue to go up. It will all set tax rate. Our tax rate is 59.9 right now. And it should be lower, at least a dollar five cents so, because the reserve funds right now is maxed out at $15 million. And they have plenty of more funds around about 18 half million billion. But sell tax is increasing right now We'll all set the budget. But the main thing we need to look at is the budget coming up. That's what we're running 
and govern the tax rate in this county. And we need an oversight to be anybody, the citizens, look over the budget and the tax rate. But the main thing you want to look at in tax rate is the schedule of value they are set every four years by the tax department. That will set your tax rate along with the budget. Thank you very much. I think I mentioned that when I became a commissioner, the second meeting I had was a budget meeting. It was also a revaluation year. And what we ended up doing was setting a, reven tax, a revenue neutral tax rate. What that means is that on average, taxpayers pay the same amount of money. Now, if somebody's property goes up more than somebody else's, they'll pay more. But a revenue neutral tax rate is sort of the, the gold standard. This last revaluation year, which just happened and you got a tax increase, we did not do a revenue neutral tax rate. That's why you got a 10% increase. Some of that increase is necessary. Uh, we've been running light on employee salaries. And the result of that is that people stay here for three years and wander off for a better salary in the neighboring county. So we had to do a lot with the employee salaries. An employee salary study was started in the last year that I was on the board and we got that finished over the time. The one part of the budget that I don't like is the reserve fund. The county has very large reserve funds. Um, in 2008, we had $16.1 million, which is twice the statutory requirement. Last year, we ended with $36.2 million, or four and a half times the statutory requirement. And the most recent budget, and we haven't had the results in, basically changed things to add a full penny to go to a reserve fund. And the reason for doing all that extra saving and building up the reserve funds was to get a better bond rating. Well, a better bond rating would get you $250,000 a year only if you have a $100 million debt, which we don't. Thank you. Next question uh, is going to be Carol. Several years ago, Lincoln County increased the minimum lot size that can be built on from one third of an acre to slightly larger than one half of an acre if county and water sewer were available, and from one half of an acre to slightly larger than three quarters of an acre if no county water and sewer were available. The purpose of the increase is the lower subdivision density in Catawba Springs. There are rumors that increases may be in process to reverse the prior these these guidelines, allowing for smaller lot sizes. Please share your position and perspectives on lot sizes and why. Let me let me say this: a lot size. These people that's in this audience has heard me for years say talk about lot sizes. Nobody wanted to do what I want to do ten years ago, twelve. You cannot stop growth, but you can slow it. You have a hundred acres, 50 acres, you can put 50 dwellings on it. Now, if you want to cluster those dwellings, that's fine. But the rest of the land is going to lay vacant. That may, you're going to slow it because you're going to, the land, you're going to have one acre before you build a dwelling. Well, I'm going to stop it, it's going to slow it. Hey, something else I've said. You don't want more people coming in? Stop the sewer capacity. That, would that make sense? We don't expand the sewer system. We can't have these small lots. Now, I, the only reasonable thing that I can think that you could do, that slows it, you don't stop it. The lot sizes, you keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller, you get them all done. Large track of land, you get more and more people, more and more houses, more and more developments, whatever. Can't stop it, but you can slow it to to one acre. And, uh, let's go that route and see what happens. Carol's right. He's actually said a number of times, <coughs> instead of allowing, um, you know, two dwellings on an acre or three <coughs> dwellings, make it one dwelling per acre. But, of course, that's always rebutted because when we try to 
dampen growth, we get a lot of backlash. And I, and I understand that because sometimes, you know, we can get lawsuits. I understand all of that. But, you know, there's planned growth and then there's growth where the developer just comes in and buys land. But we have to set the, the rules, the ordinances, for how much is um, allowed per acre. So, you know, if we said on a half acre, only one house, then, okay. Or if we said on one acre, one house, you know, I don't know who would be happy with that. I'm not sure. I know that my house would be okay, but yours might not be, <laughs> you know. But, you know, our citizens are the ones who would give us the feedback on that. You all would. A lot of people would hate that. Um, I'm not going to speak to rumors. I haven't heard rumors about that. And usually we're the first pe people to hear rumors because we get the phone calls. I hadn't heard it. <laughs> but, um, honest, you know, the, the sewer system is supposed to be uh, expanded. We know that. It's coming up. Um, developers, we want the developers to be good developers. We don't want trash. We want good development that are quality developers. So we're working hard to try to make that happen. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. I think there's two things as a county you worry about. One is growth management. The other is uh, obviously an economic downturn. Those are two things that you know are really top of mind for me when I think about Lincoln County. The growth, growth management as a whole, I, I can't speak to how many houses need to be on a piece of property or not. But what I can tell you needs to be done is a small area plan around the areas of congestion and areas of concern around this county. I say start with areas like Unity Church Road. Build out what we think it should look like in 10 or 15 years. Build a plan around that. Don't just sit here and take it one at a time and make an adjustment. Hope it works and then punt two years later and say, well, that one didn't work, let's try it again. We've got to be strategic about this, folks. If you want a county that you want to be a part of in 10 or 15 years, and you want your kids, like I want my kids to be here in 10 or 15 years or 20 years or 30 years to come back, we've got to get strategic. We have not been strategic. Take these small area plans, develop out what we want it to look like 15 or 20 years from now, and use that as our guiding light going forward. That's all i got to say. Thank you. Uh, development. If you want to have an eye-opening experience, go on the websites of D.R. Horton, Ryan Holmes, Lennar Holmes, uh, Shea Holmes Trilogy, Ryan Holmes, Eastwood Holmes. They have found Denver. And the corporate management went, wow, we have a fertile area. Uh, make a killing. They didn't go into downtown Baltimore and say, we're going to straighten out your ghetto and build houses there. They came to Denver and they said, we're gonna take probably about $2 billion out of Denver. And it's gonna go, that, that $2 billion is going to the Cayman Islands, Switzerland, Bermuda, and Singapore. <laughs> we have to get a hold of this. The developers are like fire. Fire's a good servant, but a poor manager. And that's the problem that we have right now. The, uh, the highway system, if you go on Route 16, how many lanes is it? It's anywhere from two to five lanes between Fairfield Forest and 73. That's about 18,000 feet, and only 1,000 of it are two lanes. It's basically that death-killing left-hand lane turn. To make the left-hand turn. We have to have... Uh, some sort of control over that. And somebody said, well, we don't have the sewer system. That can stop it. The same thing has happened over in Braley School Road on the other side of the lake. And the same thing is happening down in York County, South Carolina. They're up in arms about the development down there. And they've raised their resident permit from $2,500 to $18,000 or something. That's the kind of thing that we can do to stop that development and retard it until we get a hold of the infrastructure problem. Let me go in a little bit on these lot size right here. 
that citizens of this county can control lots. Don't let nobody tell you any different. You can increase it to an acre lot, because quite a few other cities and counties have done this to grow growth. That's to do too much growth in one area. They transfer it out to the other area. But you really want to look into this and cut a whole lot of this talking about it, is go over to the legislative legal library. Ask everyone that you will. Well, I'll get in there and put the districts down. You'll find out under the law that the citizens with the county commission can control districts. That is the law. But anytime you've got sewer and water expanded, you can't wholly stop developing the way the law in North Carolina is written. But one way you can stop it is in district. Use the district law. That's how a lot of counties done it. Catawba County has done it. They transfer growth for the other areas and all. But that's the main way you want to control growth because Charlotte is going to grow. Any of y'all from major metro areas know for a fact I've been dealing with this management for years. I will tell you growth will come. Any way you go at it, they're going to be developing growth. But you got to get control of it. And you got to use the legal library and the laws of this state right here and control this growth. If you don't, growth will control you. And I will have to tell you how Charlotte looked, you and your community looked, and all. Thank you. I think we got a feel there. Um, since I was the person who mostly pushed for getting the density down to two units per acre, uh, it wouldn't go any denser over my de except over my dead body, um, assuming I'm on the board. You can, of course, change the rules so that it's one acre lot sizes. That's something the county could do. It can do it essentially in Catawba Springs because the sing residential single family zoning or land use in the county only appears in Catawba Springs. So you effectively have a zoning district already. Uh, getting back to strategic stuff, we did a brand new land use plan over the past couple of years. Some of you showed up to the meetings. That has all these little small area plans and, and plans of what to do in all these areas. So we have such a plan. If it ain't right, we can tweak it. But the plan exists. And so that's where I sit in development. We don't need more development. Uh, canceling the sewer plant doesn't really solve the problem because it causes another problem. If you don't have a sewer plant, you will not get businesses, you will not get new industries, and we kind of need to have that in order to reduce the tax base. Thank you, Mark. I started my political career on the steering committee for planning and zoning in Burke County, and we redid the county zoning uh, in particular, the lake region around Lake James, and we did exactly what our incumbent commissioners are talking about. We did increase lot size so we could effectively manage sustainable growth and have an infrastructure in place before doing the developments. Uh, I have the same fear about Charlotte. I've been watching this for 50 plus years, and it's a tidal wave coming at us folks and it's going to wash over us and drown our culture, drown our families, drown, drown the farmers out. Uh, I would be in support and a lot of counties have done it, Burke and Catawba both. Uh, you can slow down the growth. You can't stop it as chairman said. You cannot stop it but you can do it in a sustainable way and the most obvious way to me to do that is to increase lot size, try to maintain some of the character and culture that Lincoln County has been for a couple hundred years. Um, I love the country into the county. Uh, it kind of scares me driving down this end of the county <laughs> because of the population, to be honest. So I would be in favor of slowing down development whatever way we had to. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Next question. This one will go to Anita. Lincoln County Commission recently approved an exception to existing zoning for commercial conversion from residential on North Pilot Mount. Nearby and adjoining residents who have been there 50 years plus spoke to the commission in opposition. 
Commercial interests prevail, as usual, even though there is empty commercial zone land in the area. Please share your position and perspective on this issue. I don't remember the specific case, but typically in a conditional use permit, as I said, it's a quasi-judicial case. Um, the findings that I mentioned are, there are four findings that have to be met, and those are the exact same, and I can't quote them exactly, but it's, it's uh, does it uh, hamper the safety of the public? And it can't be my opinion or your opinion. It has to be a uh, someone who is certified, legal, has the certifications, for example, you know, uh, an expert opinion um, that comes before us all at the same time. For example, over here, you all remember when uh, there was the Webb's Chapel with the, um, the solar farms. The group that was in opposition of that, they got together and had to hire an attorney. They paid that attorney $6,000 because he was an expert. That was the only way that we could listen to that in a quasi-judicial case because he was an expert. It's the same as what these um, judges have to hear. Uh, I mentioned to some of the folks, if they wanted to put a tattoo parlor right in front of my house, I would not be able to turn it down if it met the four findings. So I'm just saying, I can despise it all I want, and you too. And you can come before us and tell us how bad you hate it and how bad that the traffic is going to be. That's not going to help. I urge you to look up what those four findings are and work within that. Find the experts come before us with the affidavits. That's the only way that we can listen or bring the experts with you. You see what I mean? Thank you. <coughs> Greg, will you repeat that question? Yes. Lincoln County Commission recently approved an exception to existing zoning for commercial conversion from residential on North Pilot Knob. Nearby and adjoining residents who had been there for 50 plus years spoke to the commission in opposition. Commercial interests prevailed, as usual, even though there was empty commercial zone land available. Please share your position and perspective on this issue. I think first and foremost, this comes back to adjusting our zoning overlay and thinking about what these areas really need to look like long term. I'm sure there's been cases where the findings of fact haven't been met and it's been turned down or the findings of fact have been met and it's been turned down. So I wouldn't say that it's always the findings of fact that determine what happens. <coughs> At the end of the day, it's uh, whatever is decided by the commission is what gets done there. So the bottom line is this, we've got to ensure that the zoning is appropriate for those areas. If we want it to remain residential, we need to ensure that the district overlay holds it as residential, and we can't change a, a use permit and create a conditional use permit. Secondarily, when we do change these, these conditional use permits and offer conditional use permits, you can't assign a conditional use permit unless you put some conditions behind it, guys. It's got to be conditions. It's no different than the concrete plant looking to locate last night. They want to keep the uh, sediment control in place. Well. It's good to keep sediment control in place, well, as long as you maintain sediment control. You've got to put a condition on that permit if you're going to approve it that says keep, the, keep that basin in place, have a regular checkup, and make sure it meets the code that's established there. So the bottom line, I think, is it comes down to establishing the zoning, the overlay that we want for those areas. And let's uphold it. Stick to it. We can't flippantly decide on a whim that we're not going to stick with what's been done. Thank you. Well, I think the uh, commissioners have this situation that, uh, regularly. You've got party A that proposes something and party B doesn't want it. And as a commissioner, you have to, uh, personally as a commissioner, I want to hear both sides of the story. And I think as a commissioner, it's my responsibility, the commissioners, commission's responsibility to make sure that both sides have adequate preparation and 
uh, access to the resources of whatever it is. And then come to a decision. Uh, Anita mentioned the fact that there's a lot of legal considerations there, so the, the commissioners have to take that into to mind. So it's, a, it's an ongoing situation, and it means a lot to each one of those parties. Party A wants something, and Party B wants something. So we have to take those, we have to be sensitive to those needs and wants of those people. And I think that's only fair. Well, okay, talking about what happened years ago when the state required the county to zone a certain area, and it created over the years this build up. But what it is right now is the way they got it zoned, and the way people want to change it in the old zoning way. But again, I'll tell you one more time. Go to the legislative legal library and pull up districting. If you see in districting, you can form one district and you can break that district down into five or six districts. And you can overlay them district and you can not only get rid of the old district, you can create new district by overlay. People tell you you can't do it by the UDO. But look at the law and where it reads. And look at the court cases the sport did, and you will see what I'm talking about. But go to the little legal library and pull it up and look in the district, the local district, and you will find out what you need to work with, the tools you need to work with. Thank you. I was in the audience for that case, and it could and should have been turned down. And the reason is, is that it was a change in the land use plan. The land use plan is supposed to be our document for what we want the county to look like 10 or 20 years from now. And so if you have a land use plan that's gone through all the approvals and all the public comments and all that stuff, you ought to stick to it. In this particular case, I understand it's a messy one because you have commercial properties across the street. You have commercial properties two doors down. And it brings up the issue of we're probably not doing enough, and I, I share the blame for this, in not looking at the intersection between residential and commercial and industrial, and how you, how you buffer those areas. You ought to have more buffering. If you look at last night's case in the concrete plan, apparently we don't have rules in the, in the UDO to require lots of buffering for an industrial plant next to a residential area. That could be fixed. <coughs> I believe it was in 1993 and 94 when the rural areas of Lincoln County were zoned. And there's a lot of different type of zoning designations for businesses. There's IG, which is general industrial. There's neighborhood business. Uh, there's commercial. I'm not familiar with the question the incident mentioned, but I agree with some things I've heard here so far. Uh, buffering is an important factor. We want to keep the character of the county as more of a rural, family friendly. And you can control where a business goes and what the parameters. There's the North Carolina general statutes that oversee planning and zoning and set our districts. And we have some control of that on the county level. But again, I. I'm not a big fan of overdevelopment. I, I don't want to see the county overrun and lose the charm and character of this beautiful county. Thank you. Oh. Sorry. Let me, to get the particular one you were talking about, Greg, I, we were in a commissioner meeting last night. I got on the left at 30. I had about four or five on the case, and that went on very good. Pull that back out of my memory, I cannot. But let me say, let me say one thing about uh, the commissioners. It's not only the commissioners, you got a planning board that's made up of citizens all over Lincoln County. Now, when these cases heard, he goes to the planning board. Okay, everybody understand. They sit down with the commissioner to listen to do this, whatever it may be, he goes to the planning board. Then they can place conditions, they can do whatever, and then it comes back to us. And the commissioner has the final say. But 99.9% .9 of the time, we'll go on what the planning board said. 
and even Moody may go add some conditions they didn't have. Well, I can assure you, Mr. Holt, there's been a lot of conditions placed on land that's been zoned. Believe me, that's a lot, believe me. And they've seen it plant last night, according to the planning board's recommendation, they sent it back to us, they will be conditions placed on it. Now, one other thing. If you got land that's been zoned industrial general for 25, 30, 40 years, and you go in there and purchase that land beside of it, and you build a home, I'd have done my research and I never would have moved there and started with. Right. have been doing great so okay next question private enterprise has benefited tremendously over the past 60 years using management by metrics to gain effectiveness and efficiency what is your experience using metrics for operational and management levels of operation and where do you stand on using metrics for Lincoln County operations and this goes to Tim Experience-wise, obviously coming out of the energy industry, I spent 22 years developing KPIs and metrics for how we perform. It's a part of our business. You've got to know how the business is doing, otherwise you can't measure it. If you don't have the KPIs out there or the metrics, there's no way to know how it performs. I think we've done some things within Lincoln County. I've had some time to spend some time in the past couple of weeks with uh, both the police and fire, uh, as well as some other departments, and they've done a great job of establishing metrics. I think there's room always for improvement within those metrics to make sure that we're addressing the issues that need to be addressed for the county. Uh, most specifically, you think about fire, rescue, things like that. Uh, are we meeting the rescue call times? Are we, are we responding at the proper times? For police protection, you know, metrics to show us where crime happens, make sure that we ensure that our police and fire protection are adequate to meet those needs. So my position is I think we've probably got a lot of good metrics. There's always room for improvement in those metrics. And we ought to rely on those metrics to really drive our decisions from a budget standpoint and a financing standpoint for the county. I think there's more between the lines in that question than they're uh, obvious. Uh, as my other half would say, I've got too many metrics and too much data. So. Obviously, we want to know how long the response time is and all that stuff, but the bottom line is, did we get it done and we did it, did we do it within budget? Uh, it sounds like somebody's got a contract that they're trying to push onto the county to do all this stuff. I don't, I don't, there's something behind that question that I don't think that we all understand. There's something going on here. I don't know what it is, but basically, we want accountability, if that's what the question is. I don't think any, does anybody understand what that question means? Yes. Okay, so it's accountability. It's your, no, what is it? What is that question about? Measuring performance. Performance. That's not a question answer for Yeah. Measuring performance. Well, we're, we're obviously for that, yes. Obviously, if that's what the question really is. Well, let me remind the rules. We're not interacting with the okay. audience. Sorry. <laughs> what you're talking about is you you are measuring the county performance actually and how it affects you and all the department but the best way of doing it i've seen over the years is county or city and other ones is oversight committee citizens oversight committee now i will tell you right up front if the citizens don't move forward and form the oversight committee and start seeing over some of the department and some of the things the county does and let them know what how you feel about it and what you want and what you're paying for because actually you are paying for these services right here and you the citizen need to have a voice in this here because you don't i can tell you one thing my experience over the years of dealing with each department 
they will over your rule you. And the operational cost will go up. That's just the way it is. Because a lot of counties right here, a lot of county commissioners, they'll look at these departments and give them about anything they want. But when a citizen goes up there, they refuse too much to even talk to you. They got a dead ear, to tell you the truth, a lot of citizens. But oversight committees is the best way you want to do about these departments and how they operate. Thank you. I spent 30 years building business models for corporations, uh, some of them billion dollar corporations that base their decisions on how to operate based on my models. And that requires very good metrics and very good accounting from the point of view of activity based cost. The county has a lot of departments, some of which generate very good metrics. The sheriff puts out something on his web page and on the Lincoln Herald website. The animal services give us a daily report, which sort of when I got it, I was drowning in it. But it would be nice to have the county have a single page somewhere that said dashboard. This is how we're doing. Crime is up, crime is down, animal rescues are up, animal rescues are down. Not just the raw numbers, but show us the trends. Because the trends are what matter. If you're getting worse, you worry about it. If you're getting better, clap somebody in the back, give them a raise. Personally, I'm going to brag on Lincoln County's metrics. Uh, we have outstanding services in this county, and I'm very proud of them. Like was stated earlier, one of the lowest tax rates in 12 counties. Uh, outstanding sheriff's department and fire and rescue services. However, I may be very conservative as far as population growth, but I'm not opposed to taking an educated, well-researched look into how we can improve things. Might as well look at things objectively and choose the best course of action. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I agree matrix is very important, but the most important thing with what you get back of that information is what you do with the information. You know, information and matrix are good, and make sure we act on the information we got. We get a whole lot of matri uh, metrics back. Uh, for example, last night before the commission, um, we had um, Chief Flynn came before us and all the emergency services from Denver who were a part of the rescue for the tanker overturn. And they gave us, there was a PowerPoint presentation and he had all the different, and he read off all the different departments and how they all intertwined and what they all did, including the auxiliary for Denver Fire Department, the ladies who kept them fed. And it was perfect like an orchestra. So I'm telling you, there's a whole lot. I'll give one example. When I came in in 2016, I promised you all that I'd work on no kill for the animal shelter. Remember that? The county commission had said that they'd go towards no kill many years ago, but nobody ever worked on it. No kill means um, that 90% or greater, both cats and dogs separately, have to live, okay? So, that meant that we didn't put them down for space, all right? That has to be a level for 12 months contiguously. Well, that's a big deal. So I, I got a bunch of information that I paid for myself from Pets Alive in Austin, Texas, which is the best teaching facility for no-kill. And um, we, I put together an ad hoc group of some people in Lincoln County that I handpicked who had worked at some facilities throughout the United States. We were the fourth in um, North Carolina who made no-kill. And we still have to keep it up at the exact same rate, but we're doing it today. So that's a perfect metric, and I'm getting monthly, um, exactly what he said, I'm getting these monthly papers that tells us what we're doing for the animals now. So it's doing great. The next question is for Glenn. The 
Sheriff's Department is requesting funding to add a new patrol district to Catapa Springs. What is your position on adding a new patrol district and why? I'd like to go back to that question about metrics. Uh, there's 20 departments in the uh, or so in, in the county, and every one of those heads of those departments perform a metric every day. I hope. I know Bill Beam does. He's track. He knows what's going on in his department. That's where the metrics have really come in. Uh, as to the question, uh, I think Bill have, has made a good case to have another sheriff's department office in Denver, and it'll be called D, obviously. And I think that uh, he's made a good case for it, and if we have the funding, we ought to do it. Uh, I think the uh, Sheriff's Department has kept the crime down in this county. Uh, they've done a good job, and they deserve support. Our department also has. I'm all for this because Bill Bean does excellent jobs at Sheriff. He sees a crime that's moving over from other counties in the Lincoln County, and he knows how to control this crime. He's got a continuous fight, and the Sheriff Department will expand over the years more and more as the population expanding. Now, I don't have to tell you no more about what goes on in the neighboring counties right here. So Bill keeps a close eye, and Bill does an excellent job doing this. Thank you. I sat next to Bill on the county commission for four years, and I respect his judgment. If he thinks we need more people, we get more people. I would vote for that. I'm going to tell a little story right quick. When I was eight years old, I was playing Optimus football. That was my first time meeting Mr. Bill Bean. He was our coach. He instilled ethics, common sense, and hard work into us. About the time I was 10, Harvin Krauss hired him to be the sheriff in Lincoln, or a deputy sheriff in Lincoln County. And Bill has always stood up for the citizens of this county and tried to fight the criminals and the drug heads in this county and if Mr. Bean wants more sheriff support and I get elected, he can count on it. Period. <coughs> Thank you, George. Let me say I think that's one thing that I spoke earlier about more. To fund the sheriff department and safety of Lincoln County, that's one of my opening statement I said that. We, as a county, I said before, very fortunate to have what we have in law enforcement, and I'll give Bill and Pat Sheriff doing an excellent job on what's going on. To fund that, yes, we do, because there's more and more people coming here. We have to make sure, and I will make sure, that these citizens of Lincoln County, not only in East Lincoln, but in the areas around Lincoln and West Lincoln, has the most protection that they can have to make sure we do everything we can to fund to make sure that happens. In 2017, Lincoln County led the state of North Carolina out of 100 counties in building permits. Guess where most of them came to? Mm -hmm. Out here. Therefore, you have the largest amount of people. Okay, so that means that Sheriff Beans, Charlie District, is overworked. The number one thing that this county has to look for, that we have to look for as commissioners, is your safety. I sat with Sheriff Bean as he was a commissioner for two years. That's one of the most logical, honest men I've ever been with. And he has a plan. We're working on where to find the money now. We don't want to raise any taxes. We're not going to do that. But I'm telling you, if I tell you that man's honest, he's honest. We're looking for the money. Thanks, Anita. Uh, I, too, would support that. I had the pleasure to sit down with uh, Mr. Beam a couple, three or four weeks ago and kind of listen to what his plan was for this end of the county. I think we all realize that the growth here attracts crime. There's going to be more crime. 
We've got a major thoroughfare that runs through this area. I can tell you firsthand, my wife's car was broken into at Sally's Y. They smashed the window, they took the pocketbook, and went back to Charlotte. It happens. We've got to continue to increase that support in this side of the county, make sure that the citizens are safe. So I am in support of Bill Bates' plan. Thank you. It's back here. I'm last. You're up. The next question is for Robert. The Lincoln County Commission has voted to build a new courthouse complex. There are, the investment is significant. There are alternatives that could be used for existing facilities that might lower cost. Please share your position and perspective on what should be done on building a new courthouse complex and why. Well, a new courthouse is needed, there's no doubt about that, because of criminal activity here in Lincoln. And that old courthouse, it is awful, nasty, and dirty. You've got a smell to it as you go into it, as you've been into that place before. But I will tell you this, I'm all for service centers. Always have been for service centers. Because service centers are the number one thing. And as this county grows this way, the other part of the county don't grow rapidly at all on this side right here but the growth is down here. More criminal activity is down here. And on the new courthouse, I would have, if I was in there at the time, I would have moved it closer this way. I know why they built over the, oh, where they wanted that now, because they own the property in the central located in town. But it's big, always think, service center. Think where the growth goes. That's where everyone needs a new activity and all activity takes place on. Thank you. I was on the county commission and we wrestled with this choice for probably two, three years. And the choices came down to three. Renovate the old courthouse, uh, build a new courthouse in one of two locations, one of them being downtown, the other being at the old hospital. And the decision really wasn't close. Build a new one downtown, there's no parking. Was the city going to volunteer tearing down some houses to put in parking? Probably not. Uh, the old courthouse is a historic building. The cost to expand it, which you'd have to do to solve the problem, would be pretty massive because you've got to make, meet the historical guidelines of what it looks like and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Doing a new one is basically the only alternate, so that's where we are. We have the only alternate. <coughs> and as for where it can go, I'm sorry, but the state law says it has to go in the county seat. I do love our historical courthouse very much. I haven't seen the numbers on what it would take to renovate the courthouse, and I haven't seen the numbers what it would take to build a new courthouse. However, our judiciary does need more adequate facility to manage the cases, the caseload they have to hear. Um, again, I'm not big in favor of raising taxes or spending excess some of money, uh, and I do believe in the conservation of our existing courthouse. Perhaps there is property in Lincoln County that's already existing that we could utilize without a major expenditure on remodeling. That's my opinion on the subject. Thank you, George. Let me say this, being on the board as long as I have, we have keep this can down the road long enough. It's time we got to do something. I mean, I prolonged it. Mark prolonged it. Some of the other board members, we prolonged it long enough. We got to take the bull by horn to build the courthouse. In fact, one we have 100 years older, older. So it's time, you know, going on. Sometime, you know, Glenn might have to be rebuilt. <laughs> and myself, you know. But. I don't want to do anything to the old courthouse. It's a, a historical building, and uh, it was a decision. Martin was exactly like like what uh, exactly right what he said. The fact of uh, different monies and I had my own and all that kind of stuff. Carol, if I get rebuilt, but, I want to be Robert Redford. 
Good. I'll make sure that happens. But anyway, we, we're going to do it. If you're looking probably in the 40, 50 million dollar range, yes, in somewhere we look at some numbers, maybe, uh, maybe some of that reserve fund that we have, possibly could be put on that courthouse and save taxpayers money. We ought to have already as much money. Think about that. I'm a numbers girl. When they came before us, the architects that we hired that showed us the plans of the renovation for the current courthouse that we have downtown Lincolnton, they showed us the plans. So again, I'm the one who did plans for 30 years, so I'm, I'm filtering through. We're looking at them, and they've got the each end where the, um, the stairwells are X'd out. And I said, why are these X'd out? They said, well, we don't really know whether or not these can be used. We're not sure. We don't think so. But for some additional money, we can find it out. I hit the ceiling. I said, don't you ever come back in here in Lincoln County with half information. I mean, I hit the ceiling. I'm not kidding. The problem was, it is a historic building. If it's 15-inch Italian marble step, you have to replace 15-inch Italian marble step, all right? It was going to cost us $41 million, and yet the prisoners were still going to interact with the people of the jury, with the judges, because you can't separate them in that courthouse. It's dangerous, and prisoners have run off. The best-case scenario would have been if we could have built a courthouse beside the jail, but we don't have land there. So the plans are complete. It'll be pre-let for bid in March. And um, basically, it'll be completed. And we will move in, we, uh, the court system, will move into it in January of 2022. And as Carol said, we're looking at somewhere between 40 and 50 million. And we hope to use some of that fund balance. Thanks, Anita. I had the pleasure last night of seeing the renderings at the uh, county commissioner's meeting. Pretty impressive. Um, I think the bottom line is our facilities today are inadequate. We know that we need more, more cells, more area, more courtroom space. Uh, I wish it didn't cost 40 some million dollars. I wish there was a cheaper alternative. I think these guys have explored all those options without a doubt and picked probably the best option at the end of the day. I would love to see uh, some way to find, as uh, I think Robert said, there's a way we can get services closer to this end of the county in anything that we do. So I think uh, as a commissioner or as a concerned citizen, we should always consider are there ways to help provide services to the rest of the county, which don't necessarily involve a 30 minute trek to Lincoln at the same time. So that's my two cents. Well, I think it's kind of unanimous that we need a new courthouse. Uh, I would caution the fact that we don't need a, a uh, edifice that, that belongs in Cancun with vast open spaces and et cetera, et cetera. So let's not turn it into the courthouse down in Charlotte. Uh, I'm torn between uh, keeping the old courthouse and making it so nice for the criminals that are coming in there and their lawyers that support them that it smells so bad that they'll never ever want to come back to <laughs> another crime. That's, that's what I would say would be the best solution to the problem. But we're gonna to have to build a new courthouse. We're gonna to have to pay for it. They have to do it. Next. Next question is for Martin. Interest rates are at historic lows, and when used in balance method, uh, allow the distribution of costs over a longer period of time, therefore a broader population base. Please outline your position and perspective as to the increasing taxes versus the use of debt for funding long-term capital assets and why. That's always a judgment call. You raise taxes now to build up a fund balance so that you pay a little less interest over the years. That helps uh, future taxpayers. 
Uh, on the other hand, in 10 years, there'll be a lot more taxpayers. Uh, county tax revenue goes up roughly 2% a year. That means in 10 years, you get another 15, 20 million dollars in tax revenue. Therefore, a mortgage, if you take out a mortgage on your courthouse or your own house, becomes a lot easier to, to handle 10 years from now. So there's some balance in there. I don't know what the right balance is. Um, I'm not in favor of building up a fund balance for a bunch of years and then paying cash for a courthouse. Not that we could probably do that anyway. That's too much money. Um, but that's really where I am. It's a judgment call, and you have to weigh the balance. Uh, lower interest rates, if you can mail them in, uh, lock them in for 30, 40 years, better way to go generally. And you get more flexibility. Low interest rates help everybody, especially if you're financing projects in a county. Uh, I would be in favor of keeping some of our reserve and possibly looking at doing a bond uh, to finance some of these projects, um, or maybe a combination of the two. That's what I think about that. Okay, okay, here we go down the fund balance route again. Here come Peter Cocktail hopping down the money trail. Let me say, fund balance. It's more, it's more than just the fund balance. First of all, the commissioner voted two years ago or something to out here to put in 20%. We voted to have a policy of 20% fund balance. The state also mandates that you have 8% of your budget in that fund balance. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I sure like to have a little money on my heel in case something comes along that I need to pull. Now, I understand what Martin the rest of them talked about saving taxpayers' money. Also, when we go to borrow money on those bond ratings, we get a lower tax rate. Correct, Nita? Mm -hmm. So, now, and then if we got something, something to spend maybe, if you don't know what emergency might come by, you don't know what's going to happen in Lincoln County. We may have to do something uh, to pull some of that money out to just to survive the county on. I don't know that. Martin used to bring a crystal ball to the commissioner people. Is that true, Martin? <laughs> Truth. I've not got a crystal ball that I can look in. Maybe he has. I don't know that. But uh, fund balance is very important, I think, to the citizen of Lincoln County that we don't have to do something that we really don't want to have to do in the future and uh, and has been has occasioned in that fund balance when we try to balance the budget we have to go in that fund balance and finish the budget out for that year too so give me a crystal ball interest, interest rates are at a historic low um, as I said I'm a numbers girl um, I'm the one, when we are in closed session, you can ask any of the commissioners who has the calculator, who's doing a percent, 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 and if we give 1.5 from fund balance and we do from here, and we do a match from here, what if we get a grant from here? Da -da 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 -da. <coughs> That's what I'm doing, and I'm feeding it, and we're talking about it. That's what we do. There are many different ways to skin a cat. You know that. We currently are at a double A um, bond rating. Okay, the state requires that we have 8% fund balance. We have currently 21%, all right? But that fund balance is what gives us that double A rating. I would prefer a triple A rating. That'd give us like an excellent <coughs> bond rating. I understand that everybody don't want what I want, and that's okay. But, you know, as I said, we have uh, bonds that we can get, we have, agricultural department has some really low rates and we get some funding from those places. We've had many emergencies that we've had to pull from you know, our fund balance. And let me tell you something, other counties, um, Burke County, I was at a meeting in Burke County, they had a couple years that went by that they never raised taxes. The state stepped in and took over and said, you all don't know what you're doing because it was at 8%. <laughs> took over. 
raised it 25 cents on the hundred. Now you want to talk about one penny being a, a bite? Uh-huh, try 25 cents on a hundred. So I'm just saying, you know, it can get bad. We try to make it level though. <laughs> Thanks, Anita. I think uh, any prudent business person would rather use uh, leverage of money versus cash out of pocket. And I think the county continues to do a good job of that. I will say one thing about fund balance. They did approve a 20% uh, bottom line of fund balance. I think there's a lot of confusion around what that looks like. There's 10 million, which is assigned, that has to stay there. There's another 26 million, which is unassigned which is where this 20% sits today. So it's not, we're sitting on a fund balance of $37 million, we're sitting on a fund balance of $26 million, which is about 24% when you think about a $106 million budget. Now, I always tell everybody this, it's an easy way to think about fund balance. If you're a family and you make $100,000 a year, and you know you've got $100,000 in debt, or that you've got to pay any expenses that year, how much money do you want the bank? 20,000 seems like not enough to me. Okay, the interest rate now is uh, what, 3% on home mortgages, 3 or 4%. How many of you bought your home under Jimmy Carter at 17% mortgages? <laughs> so it's better to borrow at 3% than 17. I think we all agree on that. Uh, I didn't get, get to it on my uh, list of things here. But, uh, we don't want to. I don't want to belittle accountants, but I think we need to have a balance sheet, a funds flow, a cash flow analysis of, of the county finances. It's boring. Nobody wants to talk about it, but we need to have that sort of thing. But uh, if we're going to go into debt to build something. It's better at 3% than 17. What the RSC is right right here, the fund balance needs to be 8% of the budget. That's the minimum that the state requires on. But you got the excess money in the fund balance right now. And you gotta look at other funds they have already. There, sales tax and overtax on their different things. They create, they were like I said earlier, they got somewhere around 17, 18 million dollars more in other accounts. You have to look at the total cash flow here and lengthen before you do any bonds and all. You got to look at the operational expense. What is it going to be? But what they're talking about, the best way of doing it is bonds right here on it or what? But that's the question is always going to be, and it's left up to the voters on how they want to do it. But I just don't like to pass bonds one bit now because bonds can work out. Not your favor, but against your long terms. But you need to look at it closely which way you want to go and find that a project this size. Thank you. The next question will be for George. There is a growing traffic concern in East Lincoln which has been actively shared to the Commission for over a decade while developments continue to be approved. NCDOT is some five years behind schedule with critical intersection improvements. Would you vote to deny new developments until NCDOT catches up? How else would you address the traffic crisis in East Lincoln? I think that's a subject that's on everybody's mind on the east end of the county. Uh, we discussed earlier there are ways to slow development and growth. Uh, there are also ways to deal with the DOT. They have a criteria that you meet in order to get projects done. And um, I think that this end of the county has a serious problem at this point and I would focus attention on meeting the DOT's criteria to get this project completed and remedy. Thank you. Greg, who would repeat that? Yes. 
There is a growing traffic concern in East Lincoln, which has been actively shared to the Commission for over a decade while developments continue to be approved. NCDOT is some five years behind schedule with critical intersection improvements. Would you vote to deny new developments until NCDOT catches up? How else would you address the traffic crisis in East Lincoln? I guess what the question is, would you want to put a moratorium on, moratorium on, Bill? That great? That'd be a moratorium on that. I'm not for moratorium. We can't stop that. I think we've got to continue to do that. I don't <coughs> think we need to do that. The road situation is uh, something that uh, has been a very serious problem, not just lately, but in past years. You know, we had a guy come on a zoning case and he noticed that moved here in May, so I know y'all got a traffic problem. Well, I don't know if he just dropped in and, and moved in or what, but you know, he knew that when he got here. But, uh, but DOT, and we've got the, the mobility study. Anybody know anything about the mobility study? On the county done, spent $190,000, I've got it. it <coughs> list is what, list is on here of what's been done and what's happening and should be completed in uh, May, April. $190,000 taxpayer money has been spent on that. And again, stopping the building, <coughs> We have dealt with this, and all the past commissioners that are sitting in this room, we have dealt with this forever. They accomplished anything? I am not, really. Martin's not, and the rest of them, what, what have we really accomplished in stopping that? I don't have the answer except what I said about the Hager deal, and that type of thing, but stopping growth completely, I'll not go for that, but uh, I will continue to help support whatever we can to put pressure on DOT make sure that uh, we as county commissioners are doing what we can do. Glenn talks about his hands being tied. If he gets elected to be a commissioner, he better get a bigger set of scissors. <laughs> He's gonna get untied for that. Uh, because this way it is, DOT holds the strings and we contribute to do everything we can possibly as a government body of the citizens of Lincoln County. <coughs> I told you earlier that I'd tell you a little bit more about the ways that we found that we can uh, work with NCDOT. There's a group called GCLMPO, Gaston, Cleveland, Lincoln County, and a, one commissioner from our five board, board of commissioners sits on that, as well as one person from each mun municipality. So there is someone from Lincolnton, there's someone from each county, each city, in each county that I just mentioned, those three. And when I sat on that board, the very first night that I sat on that board, when I went in, I asked, excuse me, I'm new, pardon me, how is it by which that we submit projects to get them done? They gave me the answer. They said, well, you have to have plans already done. You have to have everything written up. You have to bring it to us and da 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 da. And immediately, we didn't know that. Lincoln County had never known that. So we came back. First thing we did was put $160,000 in a pot so that we could do that. And that was three years ago. We've been doing that ever since. We've done the mobility study. All the things that we're doing now are things that we can do to help with NCDOT. There are some things that we can't do legally, but we're doing the things we can do legally. And I'm just as frustrated with NCDOT as you are because I've called them about an intersection that six people got killed at and asked for a signalization light. They told me no. They said, well, we've got people that had 20, uh, had 20 deaths at it. Well, how'd that make me feel? But the reality is we're working and doing the very best that we can. And, and you have the opportunity to come to these meetings. I promote them on social media. So they're at uh, Optimus Club. I'll let you know when they happen. Look on Facebook. Thanks, Anita. I think uh, moratorium is a bad word in any, anywhere you, you go. Uh, I think it sends a bad signal to businesses. I think it sends a bad signal to the folks who live here 
and it sends a bad signal across North Carolina. So I don't support a moratorium to stop growth. I think what you've heard tonight is it's stay vigilant with NCDOT. The good news is today uh, they released an additional $300 million in funding, which will go toward the losses that were incurred from all the hurricane funds. So we had a lot of DOT funds that were slated for projects that were on the TIP. Those got washed away to fix roads in Ocracoke and Hatteras and everywhere else. With the approval of that extra funding, I think it will help expedite some of these projects on there. We've just got to stay vigilant with those projects. Thank you. Well, I think it's pretty uh, obvious that NCDOT has power. So the only way we can influence them is to get on Jason Sane and Senator Alexander to make our case. We've got to, that's the only outlet we have right now as far as the highway system, that's obvious. But I think the, the, uh, it's going to solve itself. Just imagine it's Wednesday afternoon, lunchtime. And the big weeks from D.R. Horton and Ryan Holmes are having lunch at Chilmark. Chilmark's a restaurant there in 73. And they say, well, we're going to go over and file our permits. And they get in their cars and they pull out on the 73 and they spend the rest of their life <laughs> waiting to get in the traffic. <laughs> that solves the problem. And if, if the uh, Secretary of Transportation comes over here and gets caught in the traffic, He'll change it also. There's a uh, divided highway on 150 going to Cherryville. There's no traffic out there, but there's a divided highway. How did that happen? Somebody had some power out there and got it. Why doesn't Jason Sane and Senator Alexander get that for us? <coughs> Ask them. The traffic problem is a big problem down here, and it's going to continue to be as growth grows. But the main thing is what they say a moratorium on any kind of growth. Now, one what I told you already, you need to transfer growth from one area to the next area, from the one area right here where growth is. But for the PIP concern right here, DOT, I'll have to tell you for a fact, if you run down to any of the other meetings in Raleigh, which I've been there to quite a few of over the years. They go lot out of certain monies for a certain amount of district, or for in that district, a certain amount of county. What it does when they hand it down to the planner, to the PIP right here, I'm going to find out they have their own preferences. To select a uh, planner to put you back on the PIP, it only comes down to is what money that district has to spend. But of course, they're going to blame the DOT, is going to blame growth. That's the first thing they're going to do. It's up to the county to control growth. That's the problem to begin with. But of course, traffic problems down here, if I tell you one more time, I would go to the state website right here at the DOT, look at their policy and procedures, how they operate right here. Then I'd go to the legislative legal library and I'd type in safety on roads. And you'll see what comes up in compared court cases that have to do with safety. Thank you. The original question was, was uh, basically stopping development by saying no. Uh, that's not right. In 2006, commissioners voted in something called the Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance, which included a bunch of things like if you can't prove we have enough school rooms or traffic lights or roads, you don't get to do a development. Well, all the developers took us to court along with Cabarrus and Union counties who passed the same kind of ordinance, and that whole thing got shot down. And it was really kind of unfair because in other parts of the state, four other counties and 26 municipalities, they're allowed to have that kind of ordinance. And that's the sort of thing that the General Assembly could fix for us if we wanted. I'm not sure that's the right approach, but we're basically limited by what the General Assembly lets us do. When I was on the board, Commissioner Permitter came up with having a moratorium. The county attorney told us, well, first of all, you can't do that, that's illegal. And even if you did, if you found one of the excuses that are available to you, you could only do it for six months. Well, that doesn't help any. 
So that's kind of where we are. Uh, we could do a few little road projects with county money, turn lanes into the schools and things like that, but the big projects are a BOT issue. Next question will be for Carol. Developers have contributed 1.1 million towards road needs in East Lincoln. 200,000 was used to fund a recent mobility study. Do you favor using this money as incentive to NCT DOT to accelerate intersection improvements and why? Say that again, please. Mm -hmm. Here, I'll read again. Go ahead. Yeah. Developers have contributed 1.1 million toward road <laughs> needs in East Lincoln. 200,000 was used to fund a recent mobility study. Do you favor using this money as incentives, meaning the money left over, to NCDOT to accelerate intersection improvements, and why? The money, the money has been contributed by developers and sitting in Lincoln County for projects that maybe not been completed yet. Then, once those projects are completed, then they will be paid for with that money that we have. Now, the $190,000, we pulled that, I don't think, out of that particular fund. It come from New Hill. State Transfer Tax. State Transfer Tax. Where did that come from? Not out of that. So, let's make sure we got everything clear here what's going on. There's a lot of money sitting there that... Uh, Developers have given that it would be for projects that has not been started yet or completed. That once they are, then they are paid for with that fund. I think, let me just help everybody so because we just started the question. I think the essence of the question is do we want to collect funds in some form to create incentives to the NCDOT to accelerate projects? Collect funds to accelerate projects. Uh, anybody want another tax rate? More tax? On the road. How else are we going to collect it? Anybody in here want a tax? Pay a tax so you can get on the roads of Lincoln County. Yes. Yes. One, two. Yeah, I would. For safer roads. Three. For better roads. Drive Yeah. Very little odds there. With number three out of the people that's here. No survey so, here. In, no survey. No survey. <laughs> I didn't see that going nowhere. But anyway, anyway, you know, so the money's got to be, if, you, if we do that, where are we going to get it at? I, I've been up here for two hours now, I'm over. I was striving to tell them where we get our money from it comes to y'all. Sales tax, good sales tax. Somebody has to pay for what you want. Before you can give it, you've got to take it. Very simple. It's not hard to figure out. I, don't, I wish I had a magic wand that I could wave over this and fix it. Not on this, but a lot of that as far as roads and transportation. It's been dealt with for as long as I've been on the board. Other commissioners in here have been on here and dealt with it. We're doing the best we can with what we got to do with. I, I don't know how else to explain that. Thank you. The developer funds that we have accumulated, again, we can request those funds. We cannot mandate that they give us those funds. It's illegal for us to mandate, but we do request. And, you know, we tell them, if we can have a little bit for a right turn lane here. And you know what? We need a signal light down here. And uh, by the way, a signal, uh, a stoplight costs $150,000, one signal light. Do you think that you want to pay $150,000? That's how much it costs. Yeah, DOT, yeah. And, and the truth is, DOT might tell us, no, we're not going to put it there after we done tried and tried and tried. But um, the $1.1 million developer money that we have, it, it's <coughs> slated for specific places. And so uh, we know the intersections or the right turn lanes into the developments that we have it slated for. Um, 
And as Carol mentioned, the 190,000 came out of the st state uh, transfer tax funds. The county has, I couldn't even tell you how many different funds there are. And it is by state statute, some of them you can transfer money out of into another, but you can't transfer it back. Or you, you wouldn't believe the legalities of all of it. I mean, I've been in four years and I'm still learning. But r really, we're doing everything that we can for those road improvements. Would I vote in, uh, to say no to development? No, I will not, because it's illegal. It is illegal. Again, I say it, it's quasi-judicial. I cannot vote to say no if it's quasi-judicial. We will get sued, and we will lose. I assure you, I have sat in court on the other side. <laughs> so, am I willing to fight in the way I know how to fight for it? Absolutely. I'm not the least bit scared. But there's more than one way, as I see it, to skin a cat. Thanks, Anita. Greg, let me make sure I understand the essence of the question. Because it sounds like it's changed a little bit. Would we raise taxes or do something to come up with funding to help expedite DOT projects? The essence of the question was saying, because of the way DOT prioritizes, right. you can influence them by contributing funds. So the question really is trying to get at the point, what's your position on whatever the source is yeah. of okay. using that mechanism. So I, I think the bottom line is, uh, Undersville, Cornelius, Davidson tried this for years. They set aside funding for intersections at Highway 21 and everywhere else. And, and the effort was to use that funding to help expedite DOT and get their projects pushed forward faster. Did it push them forward? Maybe a little bit. But guess what that started? A slippery slope. So all of a sudden, any road improvement that happens now in Mecklenburg County, they're counting on Cornelius, Huntersville, and Davidson to ante up the month. So we start this process, then yes, there are tax implications. There are issues that we've got to start to think about. Are there ways to use some of the fund balance? Maybe. But ultimately, once you start spending money to help expedite DOT projects, it's not going to end. Thank you. I think our best effort to uh, influence Doc is to help Jason Singh and Senator Alexander do their jobs. Uh, one thing that hasn't been talked about here tonight so far is the biggest item in the Lincoln County budget, and that's education, the school system. We want to make sure that the school system is adequately funded and is a top notch. We want the best for our kids and our grandkids. We want to make sure that that school system works and is successful in preparing those kids for life. I think that's a big item that hasn't been talked about here tonight, and we need to have some light on that subject, too. I'd like to get to the point on all the issues anyway. I don't like to talk of it. When you find the solution to it, you need to look into it. But the main thing, what they're doing is collecting funds to try to influence the DOT to do improvement. I don't think it would be hard to get them to do anything like that because I've seen it done before by other counties and they pretty, very seldom, they like to stumble around on it. But I can tell you one other time, they collect and they look at district, and they fund district. But the best way I've uh, seen to help to get the DOT to do anything is find out when the next DOT meeting they're going to have in this district right here. And their commission will be there. Main thing to do is make sure that you, all the citizens, if you have to bust them up, be at that meeting and give them a hard time. Because then that will influence your DOT, what you want them done. And look at safety. I just went off the bud right here. I gave you all the websites and safety this last night off. Go back and look at the state website right here and look and see the DOT procedure. They operate off. But the main thing I would tell you to do is the next time the board meeting they have with the commissioner in this district right here, oh, Mecklenburg is a different district. We are in a Dove district here, the Western District of North Carolina. Get in there and all the people go and complain. That's the best way of starting these projects. Thank you. The 
we have two pots of money available to us to use for roads. The $1.1 million is earmarked for specific uh, intersections and really can't be spent for other things unless the original developer agrees. Uh, none of that money gets used for turn lanes in or out of developments. The developers have to do that themselves anyway. Uh, there's another smaller pot of money, which is a portion of the real estate transfer tax, uh, of which three quarters of that gets generated here in Catawba Springs. There's almost a million dollars in that after, uh, before we spend the $200,000 on the mobility study. So there's probably 800,000 available. So we could do small projects. And what we should probably do is smaller projects like uh, in the uh, mobility study review, there are three schools that need improvement with turn lanes. Turn lanes are not big deals. You can do them for $100,000 or $200,000. A better way to would be to put more staging inside the school property, but that's all doable with the money that we have on hand. And then you can look at, well, what happens with the next increment in uh, savings account. The savings account has been going up two and a half million dollars a year. We'll probably go up five million dollars this next year. Think about allocating a part of the increase to doing road improvements. As for DOT, you get a, uh, if you contribute 20 percent of the money, your score goes up about 20 percent in the priority list. Uh, haven't seen that work really well, so I'm not sure it's worth trying to do. And 20 percent of a really big project, like widening 16 business, which is up around 40 million. We don't have that kind of money anyway. I do agree with what our two incumbent commissioners said. You cannot reallocate money that is already dedicated to certain projects. I will tell you a short little story. In 1994, I began remodeling my grandfather's house on Ada Craig Lane, Northbrook Number no. 3 School Road. It was on the corner of two dirt roads. There was 14 families that lived on the road I live on. Uh, one good advantage to being five generations in a county, if you're not related to somebody, they're an in-law in one way or another. And I happen to have some folks that, uh, in the family that were with DOT, and I discovered at that time that DOT will do a project and raise your priority level if you agree to pay part of it. Well, I stood in the middle of the dirt road watching my brand new painted house that I'd restored as a 108 year old house, watching it get covered in dust. And I said, I can't stand this. So I figured out, I asked DOT, what will it cost me to pave my road frontage? At the time, 30 years ago, it was $8 a lineal foot and they would do a 16 foot wide road. So I stood out there and I petitioned every one of my neighbors. I said, let's get this done, let's get this done. None of them would do it. So I paid the $2,000 and got my 200 foot frontage paid. And guess what? Within three months, all my neighbors said, well, we're still eating dust. So there are ways to work with DOT. And then they came back a year later because they did buy Dead End Road and looked at the Boozville Curve Road, which was notorious for everybody going sideways around it, slinging dirt, and came around and said, okay, we're talking about doing this. How much land will you give for the right-of-way? And all the neighbors said, I ain't giving nothing. I ain't giving nothing. I told the DOT guy, I said, come over in my yard 20 or 30, 50 feet if you have to. There are ways to get things done. Diplomacy, diplomacy. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to thank everybody here tonight for hanging in there because we've gone really the full time limit. I want to take a moment and thank the commissioners and the candidates for being here. I think it was an excellent opportunity to exchange information for everyone to get visibility. At this point, I'd like everybody in the audience to applause. And again, I thank everyone for joining tonight, and we appreciate Elvis and Abel. Thank you.